Welcome to episode 59 of I Thought I Knew How, a podcast about knitting and life and all sorts. I'm your host, Ann Frost, and this episode was recorded on June 4th, 2021. Today, we are regrouping. I am regrouping, but I think a lot of us are, or are preparing to, or hoping to, in light of where we are in the course of the pandemic. In fact, let's just take a breath together real quick. As we start the show today, we'll come back to that in a moment. For now, let's get this show started. Thank you to all of my patrons for helping to pay the bills. We have online patron knitting coming up on the Tuesday after this releases. And if you are a patron at the stitch marker level, I am terribly sorry that I am so late on those, but they have been mailed and should be in your hands soon. It was a crazy few months there. I feel like I'm coming up for air now, and I appreciate your patience. Patrons get some perks for helping to run the show. Hop over to patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to learn more. If you have a chance, it's very helpful to receive five-star ratings and kind comments in the app where you listen. To rate in an app, typically you open the app, find the podcast, and then there will either be an option to rate in a menu, or if you scroll downward, there will be an area where you can rate and leave a comment. Not all apps have this function, but Apple's podcast app does, and that's where I look for reviews to acknowledge because honestly, I can't keep up with all the apps out there. There seems to be a new one every week. I prefer Overcast myself, but they don't have a rating function, so when I love someone's work, I either go find them in Apple Podcasts or in Audible US and I rate and review them there. It is that helpful to podcasters, and I know that I am grateful for them myself, so I do that extra step for my favorites. Our Hat Not Hate Knit Along wrapped up on May 31st. Thank you to everyone who participated. SM Malo and Urban Compost were our two prize winners, and everyone who participated or posted or showed me hats during our online knitting time knit a total of 67 hats. And depending on the school, that's two to three classrooms of children who will receive a hat along with the anti-bullying school assembly by the crew from Hat Not Hate. I felt like I was swimming in hats for a bit myself. I knit mine from a sweater's worth of yarn that I picked up ages ago and I didn't realize was still in my stash. And now I'm glad that it's been made into something useful and sent off to be loved because while the finished hats are awesome, the yarn itself was a pain to work with and I am glad it's gone. It was mostly acrylic with 15% Angora, which is why I got it way back when because I was like, hey, cheap Angora. But the yarn was full of joins, like seven in 125 yards. So annoying. I knit it held double in the hats and I think I ended up with enough ends after I'd woven everything in that I could have put together another ball of yarn. I wish I was exaggerating, but I am not. It was a huge pile of ends. And I'm going to stop talking about it now because the market has spoken and it's a yarn that went out of production over a decade ago. So let's play some taps for it, and move on. As a former bullied kid, I am constantly working on rooting out the damage that was done in that period of my life. It's amazing to me how there are still people who it will take me more than a minute to warm up to because something about them reminds me of one of the mean girls from fifth grade, you know? And the thing is, now that I am an adult and looking back, I know that those kids who were the mean kids at the time were dealing with some really big issues themselves. I get that intellectually now. Some of them were from families where the parents were fighting. Some were being physically or verbally abused. Some were from well-off families, but were still subjected to emotional and physical trauma. We talk about childhood bullies, but when you trace the path through those kids, it often leads back to an adult. Grown-ups need to do better, and we need to make sure that the kids who are being affected, either as bullies or victims, have the vocabulary and the safe places they need to receive help. It matters so much that other adults do things that show them that adults are also willing to listen, and that's what making all these hats does. Our knit along is over, but the push for these hats is just ramping up. The deadline to send them in for this year is August 1st. That will give them time to get them processed and ready for October, which is anti-bullying month. So go stash diving again and see if you missed any blue yarn. 
A lot of local yarn stores are going to be functioning as drop-off locations. Some of them will even offer incentives to participants or discounts on blue yarn. So be sure to check in with them if you haven't been to your local yarn store lately. I know other podcasters will be hosting their own knit-alongs too. The Gravel Knits podcast has one that is going right up until the deadline. So look for them on Instagram or in your podcast app for more information. They talk about it in their latest episode. We have a bit of time before our next knit along, so don't worry about me over here. Go knit some more hats. Our next knit along isn't until October, so have at it. Right. I said at the start of the show that we are going to be talking about regrouping today, and I try to match our songs to our themes, and I think I found one, oddly enough. At least maybe it qualifies for the whole regrouping in the sense of grouping again. (laughs) This is Do It in Style by Frost. Okay, it is time to regroup. It has been a much busier year than I anticipated when I sat down in December and planned out my year of projects. A pretty major trip was added in that I wasn't expecting, as well as a pretty major shoulder injury. And I hadn't planned on the hat not hate knit along. But all that said, I was managing. I was managing. I was keeping up with my one major project a month goal until we got to May. (laughs) Between the festival prep and my shoulder pain and the release of the new Shetland Wool Week hat, which I totally forgot to include in my plans, everything craft related just sort of went, (laughs) well, let's say there was a game when I was a kid called Perfection. It had a timer you'd set, and then you had to put something like 20 oddly shaped pieces into the proper holes and then hit the button to end the timer. And if you didn't hit the button in time, the bed of holes would jerk quickly and send the pieces flying and give you anxiety for the rest of your life. (laughs) And that's sort of what happened with my best 
laid plans for getting through a major project a month this year. Everything just sort of jumped out all over the place. And now I feel like all is chaos on the crafting front. I am going to take a page from my friend Tanya of the TJ Frog podcast and go through what I am currently working on to sort of wrap my brain around it. And I'm going to take a pause on the overall goal. I mean, really, the goal was abandoned in May. I was meant to cast on a cardigan and that didn't happen at all. But for now, I'm going to go through my works in progress and prioritize getting as many of those done this month as possible. And then I'll pick up the goal again in July because sometime in the last five years or so, I have lost the ability to mentally manage having so many unfinished things around me. And so now it just feels like chaos instead of options. And so it's time to manage some of the chaos. All of these projects are things I started this year as projects that were more portable or more suited to car or TV knitting than the big project I was working on. So they were sort of aside from the main big projects and they've just stacked up along the way. First, I have the sweater bag by Cindy Pylon that I knit in the Kramer Yarns uh, Mach Chunky. It's almost done. I think one, maybe two nights and it will be done. I loved the yarn. It's perfect for felting. And my daughter is going to adore this bag when it's done. The main bag is knit and felted. The problem is that now it has um, unfelted knit components that need to be finished up and sewn on. So the unfelted pockets have been knit and they just need to be attached. But the flap over the main compartment needs to be knit. And that's it. I need to sew on two pockets and knit a flap. Yeah. The next one I started was the favorite blanket from Bernat Design Studio. I'm knitting this with what I thought was the last of the acrylic yarn in my stash. I'll talk about that more in a bit. This is the project I started to be a baby blanket for a friend. And I only have about six inches done. And I have, I think, less than a month until the baby arrives. But it's also a blanket and we're heading into summer. So I'm hoping that the mother will be forgiving if the blanket is finished in like September when the temperature begins to fall again. I thought it would be a quick knit, but every other row in the pattern, you purl two together, leave it on the needles, and then knit two together into the same two stitches and then take it off the needles. And that row can be a bit of a slog. I do love the texture that it gives the piece though, so I'm willing to stick with it. I think it's going to be great when it's done. It's just way more time consuming than I expected when I cast on. The sweater from April is also not quite done yet. This was the sweater I'm knitting with some green Weekender DK that hung around in my stash through many D stashes because I thought by looking at it that it was a mercerized cotton. And so as I was like removing man-made fibers from my stash, it was under the radar because I just went by look instead of reading the label, but it's actually pretty much half cotton, half acrylic. I'm not totally in love with how the yarn is working up into the Aria sweater. If you remember, this is um, a stocking stitch v-neck body with old shale sleeves, and I only have maybe three quarters of a sleeve to go. So I'm going to stick with it. I suspect that the sleeves and the ribbing at the bottom of the sweater are not going to block the way I need them to because of the acrylic content, which is not something I picked up on when I did the swatch because I just did stockinette for the swatch. I really should have included some ribbing in my swatch. I would have realized that it doesn't hold a block very well. Lessons learned, but even if the results are less than ideal, I think I'll be happy to wear it around the house. So I'm going to go ahead and finish it up. One of the things that I was told to do as I was looking online for advice about my shoulder problem and thinking that it was caused by all the knitting I'd been doing was to shift the type of crafts that you do in a day. So don't just sit and knit for four hours, but like knit for 30 minutes and then crochet and then do some beading and, you know, just like incorporate some different movements by doing some different crafts. So as I was functioning under the belief that that would help, um, I added a crocheted blanket to the mix and I'm using the giant cone of mystery yarn that I found at Goodwill two or three years ago for $6. 
Its three strands run together. Two appear to be nylon or possibly rayon, and one is a cottony looking white strand that is definitely an acrylic of some sort. I am double stranding it, so it's really six strands now, and crocheting the Spin Me Around blanket, which is a round blanket with a three row repeat that has some chain two spaces in it to create an opening, and then those spaces in each row shift slightly, so it creates a spiral out from the center of the blanket. The three row repeat is perfect because it will allow me to just keep going and make it as large as I can. I'm hoping to use up the entire massive cone and have a good size blanket when it's done. You're probably envisioning like the normal cones that yarn comes on where they're sort of angled like a a pyramid sort of shape, but round a cone. I guess that would make it a cone if it's a round pyramid Um, and maybe, I don't know, eight or 10 inches tall. This cone is like, it's at least a foot tall and it's a column rather than a cone. So it, it has tons of yarn on it. I'm about 20 rounds in and the rounds already are taking about 20 minutes. So I do not expect to finish this project anytime soon. I just want to make some progress on it. I have two projects that I started as classes in the Morehouse Merino Flock Group that I need to finish up. One is the Wanderly Socks that I have finished precisely one toe of. Actually, I have finished a few rounds of the foot and these are knit in sportway yarn. So they will go quicker than normal socks. But you all know how I feel about socks. And even though the class with Amy Snell was fascinating, I learned a lot. It got me through and over some of my issues with socks. I will say that I am having a hard time getting past my overall prejudices about socks and getting back to them. So those are there and I do want to finish them. They're actually on my desk. They stare at me every day and like a lone tear falls from the edge of one of the sock toe wondering when I'll come back to them. The other project is the Tarjuin cowl, which I cast on after everything went into chaos stage, which just proves that I am a glutton for punishment. But I'm knitting this with, uh, I think it's the two strand Morehouse Merino two strand. It might be the three strand. I have a hard time identifying them unless I have them right next to one another. But it's in a very light sage green and then a dark, more foresty green. And yes, everything was in chaos already and I shouldn't have cast it on, but I wanted to cast it on because it's color work and I really was like, I had just finished the Shetland Wool Week hat for this year and I loved it and I wanted to do more color work, so I cast it on and that's my excuse. I have the fleece from Garth's Croft that I am still spinning using a drop spindle a little bit at a time. And I have the two hats that came with the knitting loom kit that I need to eventually finish. And then I'll donate to Hat Not Hate through UNU Fiber Arts for Life when Rachel starts collecting hats at the shop. And finally, I think finally, I think that's all. I think that's all. I have a Shetland lace shawl called Lauren designed by Gudrun Johnston that I'm knitting in Uradale Yarns first clip yarn. And I'm nearly done knitting the garter stitch panel and I'm super excited to get to start knitting the lace portion because that's the whole point. I started this because I wanted to knit lace and then it's just been days and days of knitting a garter stitch triangle as the start. So I'm really excited to get to that. Not started, but something I want to do also. I have yarn for three more of the crofters kept hats, which are the Shetland Wool Week hats for this year. I'm not going to get to them this month, but man, I'm so like the color. Can we just talk about Wilma Malcolmson for a minute and how amazing her color choices are and the blend she comes up with? Have you seen De Crofter's Kep yet? The color combinations are incredible. Like the Jameson and Smith one is oranges and reds and browns, and it's so beautiful. And then The Jamesons of Shetland one is these blues that just sort of melt into one another. They are so gorgeous. Sorry, I'm just like thinking about the color blends and getting quiet and pensive as I do so. (laughs) They're so beautiful. If you haven't seen them yet, just go to shetlandwoolweek.com and have a look at the color combinations. Or let me look real quick. Wilma did a couple extra Um, So there's five official colorways. This is, how's that for Foley work? 
I'm looking up. I want to make sure I have Wilma's. Yeah, Wilma Designer on Instagram. And you can see she came up with some additional colorways that are not in the pattern for two companies that um, are very new wool companies up there, Laxdale Yarn and Aster Ooh. They're both lovely and they're totally worth seeking out. They both ship. There are other options for color combinations if you are interested. Okay, yeah, I think that's everything. Of that list, I am hoping to finish at least three things by the end of the month, possibly five. If this is the case, I will count myself as back on top of things enough to move forward with the projects I really wanted to knit this year. The amount of background noise from the unfinished projects calling out to me should be back to a manageable level, and I will keep you posted. Knit New Haven Spring Knit Along is in full swing. Receive 10% off three hanks of yarn for a shawl project and knit along with all the rest of us who are addicted to shawls and running out of room for them in our closets, but we don't care because they're the perfect way to dress up an outfit and stay warm, especially in the summertime when places blast the air conditioning so your cute summer outfits suddenly become a prescription for pneumonia because for some reason the same movie theaters that heat the rooms to 72 in winter think it needs to be 60 in summer. Not that I'm bitter, but let's just say that we all need a good shawl or 12. So knit another with Knit New Haven. Visit the shop when you are in town or check out their shop at knitnewhaven.com or give them a call about any of the yarns you see them post about on their Instagram at 203-777-5648. That's 203-777-5648. And of course, the link will be in the show notes. This month, the Morehouse Merino Flock is working on two things. First, a little bit of self-care. Take 15 minutes a day to knit. It's good for you. The second thing is they are working on the Cancun Lace Top. It was originally designed for their sport weight yarn. It makes a cute little summer top, but Erin did an experiment and knit it in their lace yarn, and it is an adorable topper to wear over a summer dress or a tank top. Plus, because it's a flock group project, you'll get all the help you need to finish it up successfully in the 30 days of your membership. Plus, you are free during that time to work on any of the previous knit-alongs and get help for those too. And at any point, you can cancel until the next project you want to join in or just stick around and keep enjoying a distraction-free social knitting space with the rest of us. Learn more at morehousemerinoflock.com. Also, while I have your ears, mark your calendar for October 15th, 2021 for the next Morehouse Open Farm Day, which will take place in person at the farm the day before Rhinebeck Sheep and Wool Festival. I'd love to see you there. I got my summer wardrobe all sorted out over this last week with a few shipments from Wool and The first package arrived with the new Stella Scoop Neck Tee. It is made from the same material as their wool dresses, but it's a relaxed fit tee. And I love the cut of it because t-shirts seem to come in two cuts, typically. Super boxy or super fitted. And this is neither. It fits well in the shoulders and through the bust. And then it hangs nicely too. So it's not clinging to any lovely lady lumps I have that I don't necessarily want to draw attention to. It's super comfortable And I wore it five times the first week and didn't even need to wash it at that point. Then just yesterday, three dresses arrived. They have a new cut called the Maggie Swing Dress. It is like a very A-line t-shirt. I'm very much a pear-shaped person and it fits over my hips fine. It's super comfy. I still love my Rowena's, but the Maggie has a scoop neck and short sleeves. So these are definitely going to be my summer dresses. Have a look and see if these make sense for you. Find the link to Woolland in the show notes or visit ithoughtinewhow.com and click the Be a Booster link at the top of the page and use the link to Woolland there. If you do decide to try wearing wool through the summer, you will be helping to support the show. Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to make sure I was using the word correctly. So I looked up the definition of regroup. And I know that's like a horrible way to start talking about something. It's they always say, don't start by defining your word. And yet here I am doing that. The first definition of regroup is a reorganization after an attack. And I thought, yep, that sounds about right. We are coming out of such an odd period of our lives. People have been lost. Jobs have been lost. 
Even those who kept their jobs and loved ones through the pandemic lost smiles and gatherings and opportunities. It's been such an odd time that I find my brain will just skip over it. Like things I initially think were just a few months ago, I stop and realize it happened a year and a half ago. And it's not like we stayed stuck at home the whole year. We found ways to travel safely and have a few adventures still. But it was a year of learning that I don't mark the progress of a year with the big events, but with the small repetitions. Knit club meetings on Thursdays, church on Sundays, get-togethers with friends on Friday evenings. And, And those events, those clickings of the minute hand on the clock of the year are what were taken away. I think it's okay to acknowledge that this was not normal, that this time was taken away. Whether you want to blame the virus or the government, we had time from our lives abnormally taken away. As life goes on, we marvel that weeks pass so quickly, but it's those little touchstones of the week that help us process the passage of time. The last 15 months or so feel largely empty in retrospect. To me, anyway. Where we live, things are slipping back into normality. There are faces appearing again. Places are opening up. Events comprised of people all in one place together at the same time are taking place and being planned for the future. Baseball games and festivals and concerts. The little moments of the routine are reestablishing themselves in the stream of time, too. I'm not being swept down the river anymore. I'm stepping along the riverbed from stone to stone. At the same time that the world is coming back to life, I'm personally facing some endings and some beginnings. The endings are all things I requested. Some volunteer positions are coming to a close. And even though they are ending by choice, they are still ending. And I find myself mourning the closure. But those particular closures are coming because of some new beginnings. I had some thoughts Way back before the pandemic threw us all into limbo to try something new. I had put out some feelers. I talked to people who were doing what I wanted to be doing. And then a a whole new vista opened before me. And as I start to navigate this new landscape, now that the world is opening, more opportunities have appeared on the horizon. And so I find myself regrouping. I'm squaring away the last few commitments and responsibilities relating to aspects of my life before and during the pandemic, and I'm pulling new processes and habits into place so I can travel the new territory before me. It's been an odd time, but as we all head back to normality, it's a natural moment to ask yourself if your old normal is what you want. Nothing made me roll my eyes harder over the last 15 months than when someone would say the words, the new normal. Nothing about the lockdowns was normal. It was a completely abnormal time. But we are heading back to normal, and the most normal thing to do at the edge of the return to normal is to question whether that is the normal you want anymore. What would you change about your pre-pandemic life if you could? What would it take to shape your new normal so it looks the way you want it to? Put out some feelers. Talk to those who are doing what you want to do, whether it's a different job or a new habit or a new way of looking at the world. And then stand up in the current. Take a step in a direction you've been wanting to go and see what happens. And let me know how it goes. Here's another song for us before we wrap things up. This is Orange Orange by Jamie West. Just how metaphorically are we meant to take this song? I don't know. Maybe he really just lost his orange. I'll see you on the other side. Change without change. 
Has anybody seen my orange, orange? Have you seen my orange, orange? It was right here, but now it has gone I miss you more things before I go. I've talked about it online and at at least one online knitting event, but I can't remember if I've said anything on the podcast. My shoulder pain ended up being frozen shoulder. It's not anything to do with knitting or ergonomics. It just sometimes happens. They aren't even sure why it happens. It's more common in women, like 70 to 30% the split, and it typically happens between the ages of 40 and 70. It's an inflammation of the lining of the joint. It tends to come on very slowly and get worse over time and eventually can get to the point where you just can't move the shoulder at all. I was fine pain-wise unless I hit the edge of my range of motion or I actually like physically knocked into something with my arm and then the pain was so severe I would see stars and be unable to draw a breath. It tends to resolve itself over the course of 18 months to three years, and in the meantime, it can cause other secondary issues that are more severe. The treatment was a cortisone shot directly into the joint to knock down the inflammation, and now I have exercises I'm supposed to be doing daily. The shot sounded horrifying (laughs) when the doctor told me about it, but honestly, the pain was minor compared to the pain when I would trigger the pain in my arm. Uh, There is still pain now, but it's steadily improving and it's no longer so bad that if it's triggered, I can't breathe. So that's good. But I'm throwing this information out there because I think that as knitters, we tend to assume that any arm or shoulder pain is a repetitive strain injury from our hobbies. And the treatment for that is, you know, to sit properly and take breaks and things. But this was something totally different that I ended up putting off way too long because I was blaming myself and how I was sitting and I should be doing things better. So I want to put this out there. Don't put off going to your doctor if you find yourself dealing with something similar. It's worth having it checked out so you can handle it in the proper way. Shetland Lace was recently named as an endangered craft in the UK. 
The Mackinac Way through Shetland Tour planned for August 15th to the 22nd, 2021 will connect you with three of the best known Shetland lace knitters in a small class setting, allowing you to learn this heritage craft directly from the source. It is absolutely worth the trip to learn from these women. I can't tell you how informative they are. Learn more at ithoughtiknewhow.com slash Shetland. We currently have one last spot in the Fair Isle week of the tour. Grab a buddy you're willing to share a room with, though, and we can take both of you. Again, the details on both trips are available at ithoughtiknewhow.com slash Shetland. And I just want to say for a moment, men are welcome on the trip, too. I have had a few men sort of like reach out and be like, ah, this is a trip for men and a trip for women. Everybody's in individual rooms with their own bathrooms. There shouldn't be any weirdness along that line. those lines. Men, you are welcome to join us. Absolutely. For those of you who have signed up already for the trips, my partner in the trips, Jolene Garriock of Island Vista and I are going to be writing blog posts to answer some of your questions about traveling to Shetland, what to pack, what will happen if we need to delay the trip because they won't let us in. <laughs> and other issues. Watch your email inbox for that or check out blog.ithoughtiknewhow.com. Even if I'm not the person who writes the post, I'll put a blog post up there pointing you to uh, Jolene's blog so that you can find the information there. If you are in the New England area, the passports and bags for the I-91 Shop Hop are now available at the nine participating yarn shops. It is the same bag as the one from last year that was canceled for 2020. But if you have the bag from last year, you'll still need to pick up a new passport because the list of shops has changed. The event will run during the second and third weeks of August, so you have plenty of time to plan your attack. And it will take a bit more planning this time because the shops are not aligning their store hours like they have in the past. So you're going to have to uh, research your trip a little better, maybe, perhaps. Learn more about the event in the I-91 Shop Hop Facebook group and stay tuned to this space for more information about the Shop Hop as well. Some of you I will see this coming Saturday at the Mackin and Shetland Dialect event with Vivica Villapulai of Uradale Yarn. This Saturday, we will begin knitting their fairy cowl as we listen to Vivica's talk about Shetland knitting dialect words. The following Saturday, we will tackle the Fair Isle section and enjoy a tour around the farm itself. You should have gotten an email from me already with the preparation instructions and link for the event. If you didn't see it, check your spam or promotions folder or let me know and I can resend it. If this all goes well, we're hoping to repeat the event, so stay tuned for another opportunity to join in if you miss this go round. As always, you can find all the links to everything I mentioned in the show today in the show notes. In the meantime, thank you for listening and knitting with me for a bit. If you'd like to support the show, please visit patreon.com slash I thought I knew how to make a monthly pledge. You may also consider making a purchase from one of our sponsors by visiting the website I thought I knew how.com and clicking the link at the top that says be a booster. While you're on the site, you can also find the show notes for each episode. Thank you ever so much to my patrons, to Knit New Haven and to Morehouse Farm for sponsoring the podcast. Find me on my social media accounts as I thought I knew how, except on Twitter where it's just thought I knew how. The groups on various platforms are all called I thought I knew how podcast. Until next time, may you be blessed with stitches that never drop, yarn without joints, and plenty of time to knit.